right, uh, my name is Javier. Today I'm going to share with you why native advertising is dangerous to consumers of published media. Uh, but to start, I want to ask how many of you have used the internet in the last year? <laughs> I would assume uh, that it's all of us. So um, you might be thinking, what is native advertising? Native advertising is an advertisement that is specifically disguised to look like a real news article. Now, uh, just to give you an example, there's a couple of different forms, but the one I want to present to you, uh, imagine you're reading a New York Times article online, and you're scrolling through and you see an article that catches your attention. It says, why Tide Pods are safer for teenagers than regular detergent. And you think that's obviously not true. So you scroll through and you're reading, and you think, wow, there's some very convincing arguments here. I think I should buy some Tide Pods. And you continue to scroll down, and at the very bottom you see a link and you click on it, and it takes you straight to Amazon.com. It puts three orders of Tide Pods in your shopping cart, and you realize that you've been subject to native advertising brought to you by Tide. So you know that the argument, or not the argument, the article that you saw wasn't true. Now, why is this dangerous? Because uh, native advertising is difficult to identify. Publishers are monetarily motivated to continue and expand native advertising. And there's large industry participation, and specifically today I'm going to talk about the pharmaceutical industry. Um, but the reason why native advertising is difficult to identify is that in a study by Contently.com, their research found that 63% of consumers could not accurately distinguish branded content from real articles. Um, and one of the problems with that is that their articles are designed to look uh, and, and share easily. So not only are they affecting the consumers of their content, they're affecting the people that you share it with in your circle of friends on Facebook and social media. The other reason why it's hard to identify is because um, there is inadequate labeling. Uh, a study by Yale University concluded that only 54% of disguised ads contained language anywhere on the ad um, with the words sponsor or sponsored by. In the conclusion of that study at Yale, uh, they found that most respondents were unable to identify native advertising as paid content. Um, now, my second major reason is that publishers are monetarily motivated to continue and expand it simply because it puts money directly in their pocket as a struggling industry. Um, native advertising accounts for $4.7 billion in ad spending back in 2013. Um, $7.9 billion in 2015, $21 billion proposed in 2018, and up to $53 billion in 2020. And the issue with that is that the money that they receive goes directly into their pocket, less the expenses to hire an editor to make an advertisement look like a real article. Um, in another article by Contently.com, the major publishing sources uh, that consumers view as trusted establishments can charge up to, well, not up to, over $100,000 for an ad campaign. Uh, National Geographic charges $150,000, Time Magazine charges $200,000. Um, and the reason why they're moving over to native advertising in these disguised articles is because banner ads are so ineffective that we only click on them two-tenths of 1% of the time. Almost never. They expect you not to click on them. Um, the Time Magazine CEO says that editors are going to be working for the business side of the equation from now on. He explicitly states where his interest is. Uh, BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed CEO Jonah Peretti says that 100% of their revenue comes from brand content. They represent 76 of the top 100 major brands. And as the time of me writing this speech, one out of every five articles on the BuzzFeed homepage is branded content. Um, and that's on top of the banner ads that surround the outside of the website, regular advertisements that we're able to recognize. Um, and the third and most dangerous reason why native advertising is dangerous is because of large industry participation, things that you and I consume. Today I'm going to talk about the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, PharmaExec.com, which is a website that caters to pharmaceutical companies looking for data on consumers, they state that, um, I'm sorry, uh, Nearly half of patients said they felt a better about taking medications and treatment after reading about fellow patients online, whether or not it was true. Um, online research is a powerful tool for all consumers, and so when native advertisers and uh, major brands own the content that you're using to research new products that may help you in the future, all that ability to do homework is gone. 
Uh, and the problem is growing because mobile ad spending is expected to grow 45% this year to 50 billion. Uh, and on top of that, 2013 prescription drug spending grew to 329 billion. So for perspective, for each person in this room and everyone in the United States, that's $1,000 per person on prescription drugs. Um, and of the 20 largest lawsuits in pharmaceutical history, all of them are because of violations of off-label promotion or false claims. These false claims all appear in a form of native advertising. Um, every company listed settled for over $300 million more than once, which means that there's a pattern of continually publishing this native advertising and it's effective for people. So in conclusion, native advertising is dangerous to consumers because it's difficult to identify. Publishers are monetarily motivated to continue to use it. And uh, large companies like pharmaceutical companies will continue to abuse it. Thank you. I've got just a couple of minor criticisms. Most of what I'm going to say is very positive about the presentation. We'll start off with the one thing. You start your proposition off with the word why. <laughs> I'm going to explain to you why this is true, and that turns it into an informative speech instead of a, an argumentative speech. You want a declarative sentence that says, this is happening, this is harmful, this is dangerous. Not, I'm going to explain to you why it's dangerous, because now you're just informing us about what's going on instead of making an argument that says it is, in fact, dangerous. So that's a, a, it's a technical little thing, but that's, a, that's an easy fix. So uh, you want to be careful about that. I thought that you had a, a preview. It's, there aren't numerical signposts in the preview. So if people are not listening as carefully as they might, they wouldn't realize that that's what you were talking about. It sounds like an explanation that you're giving, not a layout of where we're headed. However, because I am listening, I knew as you got to each of the supporting points that those were the points that you had in the first part of the speech. So you, you need to, I'm sorry to say it, I don't want to make anybody sound like I'm talking about you. All audiences are this way. You got to dummy it down for a, the audiences a little bit. Audiences who are listening, we said it, listening is different than reading. If you read something and you don't understand it or you're not sure what's going on, you can look back at it. When you're listening to something, you gotta make sure it's clear right at the beginning. Other than that, everything else was really spot on. I thought that you were very clearly organized when you were presenting. Um, there were smooth transitions between the points. Your evidence was generally excellent uh, and clearly cited. Uh, it is a chain argument because ultimately it comes down to that last point where you're saying there's a, a potential harm here and you are dependent on the one example of the pharmaceutical industry. So I thought that that was pretty good. Maybe you could give examples of other things that where people could be at potential risk from, you know, false claims in the advertising. And, you know, uh, just thinking about it, there's one other th there might be one other point that you could add to the argument to make it stronger. It's a little tough at, you know, you've got only six minutes, and that is that this is harder to regulate for uh, accuracy and truth than other kinds of advertising are. Because um, if it's an ad and if it makes a false claim, then it's a violation of FTC rules and you know somebody's going to get in trouble for that. Your argument might be that people wouldn't even know that that was going on or the FTC isn't good, doesn't have the ability to look at these kinds of things it's, or it's gotten harder for them to do that sort of thing and kind of enforce what the rules are. So I think that might have added a little bit, but I, it probably sounds like I'm being harsher on it than I really am. It was a very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.